Hi there, this is Robin, and we're going to be doing some more assembly language programming by popular request uh, in Turbo Macro Pro again. So it's just a continuation of last episode. First, I want to mention a couple things. Thanks very much for the response. There's a lot of enthusiasm. I've noticed there's a lot of people wanting to learn assembly language. Uh, last episode, I have to admit, was entirely unscripted. I, I didn't plan it out at all. One big error crept in. I had said that the stack, the CPU stack on the 6510 was a first in first out queue, but that is of course wrong. It's actually a last in first out. And just to really quickly illustrate, I got some VIC-20 cartridges here, the count, and then if I put another game on top, like Tooth Invaders, and then I put another one on top. The sky is falling. I now have three items on my stack. And when I remove one, I'm going to take the one at the top. So the last one that I put on the stack is the first one to come out. This is pushing something onto the stack. This is pulling or popping on some processors, but the 6510 is pull. I'm pulling something off and then I'll pull another one and another one. The stack is empty. Thanks very much to Christian for pointing that out in the comments and for being so polite about it too. <laughs> Everybody who's been leaving comments has been so kind so far and I really appreciate it. And another error is that I didn't make it clear that Turbo Macro Pro only runs in C64 mode. As far as I know, there isn't a Commodore 128 version. You can run it on your Commodore 128, but only in 64 mode. So sorry about any confusion there. I'm sure I'm going to mess up more. I hope this is still uh, useful to you. I'm enjoying putting this together. I should mention I'm also doing this for my kids, particularly one of my sons is interested in this and he watches every episode. Just shout to Peter there. I'm really glad that you're interested in programming. Whatever we can do to encourage you to keep going with it, I think it's great. So last time I mentioned Turbo Macro Pro, we used the version that didn't require any expansion RAM. Today I do want to show you the version that uses expansion RAM. Everything else I'll be talking about will still work with either version of Turbo Macro Pro. I had a request for this and, and anyway, it sounds fine to me. So to use this version, in addition to the Commodore 64 or Commodore 128, you also need a RAM expansion unit, such as this CMD version. I did a whole video on these a uh, few episodes back. I'll put a link down below so you can watch that. So if, you, if you're interested in these RAM expanders, you know, please do check out that video. And because I wouldn't want to do any assembly programming without my handy Super Snapshot, it's not required, but I love the thing. So I'm going to use this EX3, which I also showed you in that previous video. And it allows me to plug in two or even three cartridges at once, as long as they don't conflict in their I.O. space. And these two get along well. The Super Snapshot uses the memory space at DE100 in the C64 memory map, and the REU is at DF100. Okay, so I'm going to plug that into the expansion port on my 128 and power it up. Always turn off your computer when you're plugging things into it, especially on the expansion port. Okay, and I'm going to power on. And here we are in the Super Snapshot menu. Press Delete to exit out. We'll put in disk to a directory. So this is the version of Turbo Macro Pro that you use if you don't have a RAM expander, RAM expansion unit. And this is the version that we're going to use today. So I'm going to load it with the percent sign. If you don't have a wedge that lets you load with the percent sign, then you load comma eight comma one. And you start the program in the same way, SYS32768 or eight times 4096 as the documentation says. And so it's just the same as last time, but we'll notice down in the bottom right hand corner, it has detected that you have 512K of expanded RAM and that's in addition to the 64K that's in the computer. And then down below it, it tells you what bank is active. And really you only need two banks of 64K each. One is to build your object code into, and the other is where 
your source code, and the assembler itself lives while you're testing your program. So in a sense, you have 192K in use, 64K in the C64, a 64K bank that contains your source code and the assembler while you're in testing mode, and 64K where the object code gets assembled to and then swapped out with C64 memory. I'll explain that in a little more detail later. Last time we did a simple program and without the RAM expander, I had put the starting point to assemble to location 1000. But just to show what the power of the REU version is, I'm going to go here and change to assemble to location 8000 where the assembler program lives also. If we weren't using a RAM expansion unit version, this would crash the computer. The program you're writing would overwrite the assembler that is trying to assemble your code. It just wouldn't work, or at least eventually you'd end up with a crash. Even if you didn't overwrite the actual assembler part, you'd overwrite part of the program and you wouldn't be able to re-enter the editor. Just to illustrate how this works, we're going to go here and I'm going to write the same program. Just a label like loop increase do 20 that's the border color and then we're going to jump back uh, to loop and just like before back arrow is like escape three to assemble we're ready to go s to start and there you go the program is working fine and you see that the borders are changing color rapidly like before and then if I hold down on stop and hit restore, we're back. But watch this. Instead of typing SYS32768 or 8 times 4096, we're going to assist to 320 and press return. We're right back in the editor looking at the program. And so what's happened here? One more time, back arrow 3. The program has been assembled into the RAM expansion unit. And when I press start, that bank in the RAM expansion unit is transferred into C64 memory and executed. And meanwhile, it's been swapped with what was in the 64 memory, the assembler and the source code. That's being swapped out into the RAM expansion unit. And it does it almost instantly. Like I was mentioning, it can move a whole megabyte a second. So 64K just takes a, a very small fraction of a second. It's basically instant. Now when I hit run, stop, restore, we're just back in basic and we can go here, SYS 320. This is a very tiny program that lives in part of the stack memory, an unused area usually. Actually, we can look at this with the monitor. I'm going to hit the super snapshot and I am going to disassemble location. You put plus sign in front to show decimal. 320. And here is a short little program. Well, it's a, it's not that short, but it's pretty tiny. And basically what it does is cleans up the state of the computer with all these various, this is all reinitializing the 64. And that's setting up the RAM expansion unit, which I mentioned lives at in the DF100 range and brings the assembler back, swaps it back out. So that's what you're doing here. <laughs> Oops. There we go. Back in. Now, when you're writing a tiny program like this, like I was saying, it doesn't really matter that much. But when you start writing a very large program, this makes a world of difference. This is the same setup that I used back in 1997 to write my first commercial C64 game, Frogs and Flies 64, uh, which Lodestar published. And I believe I was paid 300 US dollars <laughs> for that game. And that was my started into professional game development as, as modest as it was. And then from then on, I wrote uh, some Commodore 64 demos. And I also wrote some what are called mini games that were 1K, 2K, 4K in size. Once you get up to 2 or 4K where the binary is that big, it is a lot of assembly code to generate if it's almost purely code, which my games were. Uh, because they were generating the levels procedurally. Uh, anyway, I can talk about this some other time. One other thing I want to mention, again, this is a, a warning. I, I hope nobody's uh, sensitive to flashing screens, but I want to illustrate something. 
I'm going to start the program here and I'm going to tap restore and you should see it interfere with the screen. I've changed the D020. Actually, I should just show you. I've changed this was D020, which is the border color. Instead, this is the main background color, D021. I'm going to hit restore and it should interfere with the screen. Okay. See how it sometimes it's flashing a bit when I hit restore? Okay, so if I'm going to hold down stop, I'll explain this a little bit better. One thing I want to do is load A with 147. That is the Petski character code for clearing the screen. And then jump to subroutine, F, uh, whoops, FFD2, and that's the routine to print a character. So th those two lines, load the accumulator with 147, the clear screen character, and then actually do the print, single character print, which clears the screen. So let's just run that. Okay, that looks a lot better. Notice that when you run an assembly language program, it does not clear the screen automatically for you. It's up to you to do that. Okay, so if you look at this regular pattern, and if I tap restore, you see a little bit of interference there? Each time I tap it, it changes the pattern a little. So what's actually happening is when you hit the restore key, all the other keys on a Commodore 64 keyboard are wired up to the, the CIA chips. It's an input-output chip that reads the keyboard matrix, but the restore key up here is special. It is not part of the keyboard matrix. Instead, it is bizarrely wired directly into the 6510 processor onto the NMI line, that's non-maskable interrupt, and every time you hit restore, it actually causes the CPU to stop what it's doing and to process your request. And by default, that runs a little routine that checks if the stop key is pressed. And if it is, it does a little reset. And that's why we get this screen. And notice you do have to hit the restore key a little bit harder. I believe there is a resistor in the line that actually requires you to punch it a little bit harder. When you hit stop, you see that's also causing interference on the screen. There's an interrupt running when you turn on a Commodore 64 that scans the keyboard and does some other updates that Jiffy Clock we talked about before. So what we can do instead here is set the interrupt disable. This is another opcode or another mnemonic. I, sh I should have said that word last episode. A three letter mnemonic. SEI stands for set interrupt disable. So we'll try running the program here. So now you see when I hit stop here, it has no effect anymore. Okay, so an another little trick that you can use with this assembler, and you might be able to use in other situations as well is that when you hit that restore key, it generates that non-maskable interrupt. So what you can actually do is, you, know, you might be getting tired of having to hit the stop restore, or sometimes that might not even work uh, you, if you don't have a reset button down here. Okay, instead, location 0318, 0319 is a 16-bit vector in the C64 operating system that points to the routine that handles the NMI routine, which is can be caused by the restore key. What we can do instead is point that vector, and a vector is just an address that points to a routine, and it's there so it can be altered if you want to change the behavior of the computer. So let's use labels to do this. Jump back equals 140. That's the location of that little routine that calls the REU. And then what we do is lo load the low byte of jump back and store it in the NMI vector, the low byte of the NMI vector. And then we'll load the high byte of jump back and store that in and store that in the high byte 
of the NMI vector. Now in this case, when we use the label, the assembler figures out the address of this location based on everything else that's assembled. Like this is 8,000 and that figures out, okay, so this byte's assembled 8,000, this is 8,001, 8,002, 8,003 and 4, 8,005 and so on. And eventually it figures out that loop is a certain address. In instead, you can explicitly say jump back just is location 140. And 140 is the default location built into Turbo Macro Pro for that jump back routine that swaps the assembler that's in RAM expansion unit back into C64 memory so you can run it. Load A means to load the A register, which is just an 8-bit register, the primary register in the 6510. Load it with a literal value, and this symbol means the low byte of jump back. Jump back here is a 16-bit address. Well, it's at least, an, it's actually just a 9-bit address, but it, we're, it uses up all 16 bits. This loads the low byte of it. So the low byte is actually 40, and the greater than symbol means get the high byte of jump back, which is 0, 1. 8-bit values can have only a maximum of FF, which is 255 decimal. This is a 16-bit value. Okay, and we're storing it in the NMI. And so what this is going to do, we'll just run it. The assemble's fine. We're going to start it. And I'm going to hit restore. And we're right back into the assembler because when you hit NMI, instead of the regular C64 kernel scan routine which checks for run stop and so on instead this jump back routine is being called oh i hope that's clear anyway that's a really neat trick so what it means is that when you're programming it's as quick as this we're in the editor we assemble we test it and then we hit restore and we're back in our editor and this even works if you have 20 kilobytes of source code or 30 kilobytes of source code or whatever the limit is, something like that. That's something that no other C64 development environment can equal any other native uh, development environment. If you want better than this, you have to go to a cross assembler on a, on a PC or something. Now, finally, to show you something a little more, a little more interesting, we're going to keep the same part of the code here. But what we're going to do is load A with number 100. So again, this number sign means it's a literal value. Put 100 into the accumulator. And then I'm going to put a label here. Wait one. Oop. Wait one. Compare with D012 and branch if not equal to wait one. Okay, so we have the literal value 100. We're going to compare that 100 with what's in D012. Well, D012 is a register in the VIC chip that holds the current raster line position. That is, as the screen is drawn from top to bottom 60 times a second, this D012 is updated with the current line. So it's very quickly counting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And when it gets up to the top of the screen about here, at the very top above the top of the cursor, that's line 50. And then it's going up by, it goes up one by one, but every eight, like as I move this cursor, it's actually moving eight scan lines at a time. And then by the time it gets down to the bottom of the screen, down where that status is, it's another 200 scan line, so it's about 250. And then the raster continues on the bottom. So it's actually a 9-bit counter. You can read the low 8 bits of it here at DO12. And the high bit of it is stored in the high bit of DO11, which is registered with other values, uh, other meaning as well. And on NTSC machines, that's what this is. There are 263 scan lines, and the European C64 has 312 scan lines per frame, and it only draws 50 frames a second. And that's part, as we discussed when I was showing you Sam's journey, 
That's part of what makes games and demos easier uh, to run on European systems because it only has to update the screen 50 times a second. There is more CPU time per frame. And that's a luxury we don't have with the NTSC machines. This is comparing the current raster with the value of 100. And while it's not equal to it, it's going to jump back to wait one. So this is a busy loop where the CPU is waiting for a certain screen line to be drawn. And then once it does, we're going to increase DO20 and DO21. So we're going to change the screen, say it's black currently. We're going to change it to white. And then we're going to wait for example, wait two, and we're going to just repeat the same code we did above. But this time we're going to wait for scanline 150, compare it to DO12, and then do a busy loop for that. And then we're going to decrease DO20 and DO21. So if the screen was black up here, then we increase it up to color number one is white, and then we decrease it back to black. And then we're going to jump to loop, which actually I just need to put up here. Okay, so that's all just the setup code there that clears the screen, stops the interrupt, and just for our own convenience does the jump back. And here's the main program here. It, it's an endless loop of waiting for scanline 100, incrementing. Thank you very much for the correction. To, <laughs> sometimes I will say increase. The actual opcode is increment, but it's true that does increase the number as well. Increment, and then uh, waiting for scanline 150, decrement, and jump back and do it again infinitely. And let's go ahead and try to run this. Ready? And there we go. So what's happening here? Basically, as the screen is being drawn, we're dynamically changing the color of the border and of the background, and then changing it back again. And it presents itself as a rectangle, as a solid bar across the screen. And we're doing both the border and the background. So you'll notice that there is this wiggling area and that would require another big explanation, but basically the timing is a little variable. The timing is changing from frame to frame a little bit. This can be fixed in a much better way, which I, I'll hopefully get into another episode. Okay, and this is, this is totally unscripted, but I'm going to try and write a little program that does a bit more of a, a scrolling rainbow effect. Let's see if I can do this. Still going to use the same header. Loop. So I'm going to load A with a variable called, it's not really a variable. So we're going to increase raster. Then we're going to load in the current raster. And then we're going to wait and compare it with DO12. And if it's not equal, we're going to go back and then we're going to increase DO20 and increase DO21. And then we're going to add carry. I don't know, I'm just going to pick some number, 30. And we're going to store that in raster. And then we're going to jump to loop. Let's see what it does. Well, I wanted something that looked a little nicer, but that's... Could be worse. Okay, I think that's gone on long enough today. We'll pick this up in a future episode. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.